At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Well, welcome to another Drug Science Podcast. And today I have someone who I was going to introduce as the Britain's funniest scientist, but I'm not entirely sure he is a scientist. But he knows a lot of science, <laughs> but he is quite funny. And that's Robin Ince. Hello. Welcome, Robin. Hello. I'm, I'm looking forward to this because I, I keep thinking you're going to tell me you did get all the questions because I haven't got a clue. I'm really looking forward. I like these things where I have no idea what's going to happen next. Well, I'm going to chat to you and you're going to share your wisdom and your interests and possibly some of your policies with me and the, and the audience who undoubtedly will be intrigued to know about why you wanted to talk to me in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> but before we do that, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? How did you, because I don't think you trained as a scientist, did you? But you ended up becoming the, the great science broadcaster. I mean, I think the reason that the science stuff works is because I don't know anything about science. I think the, like, especially the work that I've done with Brian Cox and before that, the shows that I was putting in, all of the, my interest from science comes from just being a fascinated but ignorant person. And I think that helps in terms of being a bridge. So when I, because I, I loved science when I was a kid, then I found it really alienating when I, I think during the teenage years, and I know this is a problem I've, I've spoken to, to even teenagers now as well, and certainly a lot of people of my generation, there is a point where science went from being this exciting exploration of all the things that were around you into what sometimes seemed quite abstract symbols on a board and sometimes it seemed like a very quick change from looking at leaves and tracing things to suddenly these abstracts and so i became tremendously alienated from all of that and then when i was about 25 there was i think it was carl sagan's demon haunted world i might have been a little bit older demon haunted world science as a candle in the dark and i read that and i was like i'm missing out on so much and then when i realized how much i was missing out i thought how many other people like me felt that they just didn't really, science wasn't their thing. Their mind was not adapted for science. And so that's when I started putting on live shows where, I mean, basically what I would do is I would put on shows where I would have reasonably well-known comedians and musicians, and that's what people would come for. And then just when they were comfortable, I'd say, now, please welcome a theoretical physicist. And they would be like, hang on a minute. We didn't come here for theoretical physics. And then at the end of it, they'd go, that woman who told us all about those different ideas and, and how Einstein came up, that was amazing. And so that was, I would sneak these things in and then that kind of grew and changed and then eventually became things like the Infinite Monkey Cage with, uh, with Brian Cox. Well, of course, that's what you're most famous for. How long has that been running? It's 13 years now. We're just wow. making the 24th series at the moment. So I think we're up to like 160, 170 episodes. And it hasn't stopped being, if anything, it gets more exciting because as you know, the more you find out, the more you find out how little you know. So, so yes. at the end of every single episode, the amount I don't know is greater rather than less because I'm now aware of a new section of things I don't know. So, you know, last week we recorded one with Suzanne Simard, who is the ecologist who came up with the understanding of the wood wide web, you know, this incredible yes. network that is under the tree. And, and so you listen to her. And then the next day we were doing one about black holes. And again, you've got someone like Jan Eleven explaining black holes. And Brian and I as well, I think we still love making it so much if I, I love it more now than i did 13 years ago well i guess you're more competent you've actually you've got a lot more science knowledge now aren't you you can take on the scientists you can battle back i i don't know i don't know if it's it, i mean i think what i've i've become more confident in understanding why i don't know if that makes sense you know i, I think there were a few years ago where i would still have pretended i knew something when i didn't really and I think now I've become a lot more comfortable with the fact that, first of all, that scientists love being asked questions and that you should not be scared of it, however simple you think your question is. And then I was fascinated recently. I did a big tour for the, the last book that I wrote, which kind of was about science. And on three different occasions, I got asked things by the audience where I said, 
oh, I don't know. That's an area where I, which I can't explain. Um, I can tell you the people who would be very interesting. I said, you know, go to these places on YouTube and go to this person's book. But what I found interesting was on each occasion, people came up to me afterwards and said, thank you very much for saying you didn't know. Now, isn't that doesn't that say so much about our culture that we are filled with all of these kind of ignorant but cocksure people in the medium, you know, very often based quite high on, you know, with big megaphones. And the one thing that they're, they're, they're cocksure and ignorant. And, and actually that moment where, I mean, I know the joy when I've done, like sometimes when Brian and me are doing big tours, and we have a and a and there will be a question that's come from the audience and Brian will go, oh, actually, I don't, I don't really know that. And you can see the audience going, oh, oh, thank heavens. There's something you doesn't know. <laughs> the relief of realising that. Real, yes. But beyond science, you're also, well, you're interest, also interested in the policy implications, I think, of science, aren't you? I mean, that, that is something, you know, that's why I really wanted to talk to you about, because you, you've moved in, well, you've, you have interest in areas that aren't just simple science, it's about the practical applications. And I was fascinated to discover that you are uh, a supporter of pro-assisted dying, and uh, which I am as well, of course, yeah. dying with dignity. And do you want to share a bit about why you joined that? I mean, you're pretty young to be thinking about that. Well, I, I think, you know, I've always been very morbid, actually, anyway. I've always been fascinated. Uh -huh. from, a, from a very early age, I was the kind of kid that, you know, would hang around graveyards. And I've always, um, I saw the other day a gravestone in a, in a churchyard near Newark. That was one of the most beautiful ones I've seen, which it said, I forget the name of the man, but it said he lived a life of liberal kindness and has now been taken to his brothers like corn fully ripe. Isn't that beautiful? Like the idea that his life has been, he's lived and been so kind that he is now a crop ready to, and I, and I love that. That's beautiful. Oh, I, I'm, I'm so, yeah. But I, and also because when I, when I was quite young, when I was about, about three, I was in a car accident and my mum was very seriously injured. And I think, right. I think those kind of things can sometimes add a, a, a level of kind of morbidity. But I think one of the interesting things is we, we still have this battle with science where people say that, science answers the how and philosophy and religion do the why and i totally disagree with that i think in the world that we live in with the understanding that we have to if we are going to think about ethical quandaries about moral dilemmas and detach them from an understanding of how our brains work how we perceive the world of what we understand about pain and what we don't understand all of those things i do not believe you can detach i mean i i also don't agree with that how why split anyway and i think you know something like assisted dying i find i mean it's 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 i suppose it's the old cliche which is you know we don't ask to be born into the world but i think we should most definitely therefore have a choice of when we might be able to leave it and when i started looking at the statistics when i started looking at one of the things i mean i find it interesting I, various journalists that are very much against assisted dying i saw one of them write this piece which went well i, I mean if there was assisted dying i just know that my children would have the machine switched off straight away and i think well that says a lot about <laughs> you you know remember to be kinder to your children on the way up because you never know when you're going to be on the way down <laughs> There's far more than, but I also think when I started to look at the fact that when people do have assisted dying available to them, many people do not, people who are extremely ill, do not take that option. But the fact that they know they have that choice allows them to say, well, I do know that any time as the pain increases, as it becomes more and more difficult to have any sense of a life, I know that I have that choice. And I think that choice means, it does not mean as many people kind of, that people will take the choice, but it means that people have, you know, a, a democracy of death, I think is a really important thing. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I often, you know, do you wonder, maybe you know, are the backward in this country? I mean, we've got the Swiss, we've got the Belgians, you know, they've been allowing this for a long time. Things haven't changed. There's no, as far as I know, no major scandals. Their society hasn't ended. But in the UK, it's almost impossible to have a sensible discussion about it. It was only, I think, just a few months ago that the doctors, the BMA, actually bothered to find out what doctors thought. And they were rather staggered to think the doctors actually were more rational about it than they'd, they'd hoped because there's something peculiarly negative about individual choice in terms of health in Britain, I think. I just wondered if you wondered why that might be. I mean, I do generally think we're a very, especially in England, I think, a, a very strange and, and frequently deluded 
country. I was thinking that when I was traveling around that I, I realized that's why everyone drinks so much because it's the thing that aids your cognitive dissonance. To, and, and I think that we're not, <laughs> there's a real problem with when people are, we don't seem to have very much trust or interest in people who really do know better than us. We don't elevate some of the great philosophers and the great scientists and anyone, you know, and, and, and the truly interesting things. I think, you know, when you look at the standards of our press, which I, I think, you know, is very close to propaganda, an enormous amount of it. It does. It shuts down in this. We're wonderful at moral outrage. I mean, I find it very interesting that you see the press constantly criticizing young people for this cancel culture. When, of course, cancel culture is something that is propelled for the last 50 or 100 years. What our press is, it's constantly saying you can't have this. You can't have that. How dare you question? You know, we're looking at things, you know, whether it's Section 28, whether it's our, you know, sometimes our, a lot of the stuff that's being being written about in, in terms of kind of debates over trans rights, you know, stuff is shut down so quickly. And we, and we seem to have a desire to be very, very certain. And once you start dealing with mortality, and once you start dealing with choice and that, that is, it's a very difficult area. And it's an area where you don't want debate. I mean, we love debates. I, I, this is the thing that I can't stand it is quite often I used to get asked to have debates with religious people, for instance. And I'd always say, I don't want to have a debate, but I'll happily have a conversation. Let's stop everything being a wrestling match where one person I mean, yes, held up yeah. at the end. Let's sit down and, and listen to people. I mean, you look at the kind of reaction that Peter Singer's had to many of the things that he said, as I think a very interesting, you know, ethical philosopher. And it gets shut down because I think we prefer to be outraged and clutch our pearls than actually listen to an opinion that might change us. No, no, I think, yeah, and I think also partly stem from the English legal system, which is utterly combative, whereas the continental ones, they, they do try, try to work out what went on rather than win a battle. You know, so historically, we you know, we prefer fighting or arguing than trying to try to understand. And I find that uh, I really don't like debates at all because it inevitably pushes people. Well, it's like Parliament, isn't it? It's like the reason our mm -hmm. Parliament is so dysfunctional because, you know, you, there aren't debates, they're just shouting matches. Oh, it's, it's a horrible thing to watch, you know, and it is. The joy of victory is something that I find, you know, I mean, it was an interesting thing to watch during things like Brexit or to watch, for instance, when Trump won the American election. What I found very interesting was the, the, the delight, that why people were happy at victory was not that they'd got what they wanted, but that they'd taken away something. And this is not everyone, by the way, I'd make this clear, but, but a lot of the narrative was about how happy you were that other people had been made sad. And I do find that that, that seems to be, again, it's not across England, it's not everyone at all, but there is a delight in seeing other people's misery rather than a delight in having your own joy. Yeah, and I think, again, <laughs> quite a lot of the British press, they distill that to a precision, don't they? Yeah. Finding misery and making other people suffer is a way. I don't know. Were you at public school? I always, perhaps it's the, it's the British public school that makes kids suffer so much when they're young that they spend the rest of their life making other people suffer to, in compensation. <laughs> recompense. Well, I did actually. I went to, I hated every minute of it, and it was a great education. I went to the the school where they filmed Lindsay Anderson's If, which oh. if you've ever seen. Great film, so great film. It allowed me to watch the headmaster, etc., being, you know, shot with a machine gun by, you know, 1968 <laughs> Paris. But I remember the very first, because I went there, I was 13, and I never felt like I fitted in. And I, the, my one friend that I still have from that school, my friend Ed, we turned to each other when we were 13 because the head teachers did, did this speech and he went, you have to remember that you're the best 10% in the country. Oh, yes. And even at yes. 13, I had tremendous scepticism towards that idea. And then I would watch and I was always, I think whatever education system I'd gone through, I'd never have necessarily been on the inside. I think I'd have always skirted around the outside. But that even more so, I just watched it all with this kind of, you know, very much the alien eye. And I find it fascinating now, having watched those people who went through that system, some of them, you know, one of the things that that education system teaches you is that you're better than everyone else. And it doesn't matter how little you know, you are very often in a lot of these systems, you are the deserving rich. Well, the white deserving rich. <laughs> yeah. It's just such an, and I think, again, it's a very, I mean, I, I look watching this government at the moment, and it surprises me, there is still a divine right of kings. There is still that sense that 
you have the destiny you deserve, which was to inherit an enormous amount of money or to have some deal with a hedge fund manager or whatever, and you're canny enough to be basically almost an organized criminal and all of those people in poverty. Well, that's the destiny that they got, whether genetic or due to God or whatever you wish it to be. Yes. And I guess that's as a comedian, you know, obviously, you know, your targets and you've maybe that's where you became a comedian because you kind of had to rebel against the absurdity of the school and humor was the only way of, it was either humor or despair, I suppose. Well, well, I think most people that I know who are kind of creative generally, you there's something quite early on that makes you believe the world is not as it should be and there's something wrong with it and you don't necessarily feel this is very broad what I'm saying but it's kind of but I do think most of my friends there was something where you did not feel that you fitted in or you had an incident maybe, maybe sometimes of course there's a lot of different incidents where people like Eddie Izzard losing his mother when he was seven years old there's quite a few people as well who lost a parent adoption or gone through some kind of, and I think that bit of going right this world isn't so we're going to have to on a nightly basis rebuild it in some way and question it and create a different world while in in you know in the in the light and on the stage so how did you get into comedy then i imagine it's quite a challenging step to make oh do you know i haven't got any choice i loved it i just you know i love it and i hate it and i was as a kid i was you know obsessed with things like the goodies i mean it was such a joy i did an event two years ago just before lockdown i did an event with all three goodies tim Britt taylor graham garden and uh, and bill oddy and of course sadly tim died not not long afterwards from cape over ages but i loved all that stuff and it was i mean the two things i think were that it was comedy and it was also things like doctor who and if you watch, you know, there's everyone watched Doc 2, but then there were the kids that were really, really into it. And it really was for outsider kids. Comedy and things like Doc 2 and Blake 7 was our code. While all the other boys were doing their great cross country runs, you know, all of the wheezy kids, we'd be sat there talking about Tom Baker. And then with comedy, it was also what once alternative comedy began. I saw Rick Mayle playing Kevin Turvey on, on a show called Kick Up the 80s, and it was the greatest thing I'd ever seen. It kind of became my punk, you know, for the generation a bit older than me. They had punk, and I watched Alexi Sale, and I watched Rick Mayle, and I watched those people. And I adore it. And I think what I find very beautiful about what comedy can do at its best is it can create a positive connection. A lot of comedy can be a negative connection, which is, you know, stuff that is basically, don't we all hate this? People are united by different targets. But you also see whether it's sometimes people talking about whether it's issues of race, gender, mental health, there's a beautiful communication that can happen from it as well, a very kind of positive thing. And I think the older I've got, the more that's become a really important part of it is it you know when i've never liked that idea that you you go out on stage and you say something you know you, you kind of attack a bunch of people and then maybe some people leave and they're a bit sad because they're actually in the group i much prefer that idea that people leave and they felt that they feel uplifted to feel that they're perhaps you know it's like for my audience i think i say my audience i mean that be you know the audience i get on a night you know a lot of them i think like me would be the people who was felt they were weirdos and they were freaks and they've got lots of kind of you know inner thoughts that they might not let out and then some middle-aged idiot starts bouncing around in a cardigan talking about impulsive thoughts and i mean I, I was amazed when i found out i used to talk about the impulsive thoughts like when you're holding a baby and you suddenly imagine throwing the baby down the stairs room and i I'd, I'd not realized how many people didn't know that that was not a desire it was their brain playing them a public information film saying you're holding a baby don't chug it down the stairs and so i would have people come out to me going oh my god i thought that i really had this urge you know from my niece and nephew to, to throw them out the window and now i found out and i love you know those moments where you can turn comedy from, from those things which can plague people and, you know, this is one of the big things. I mean, going back to the thing you'd saying before about, you know, about our national character, I think one of the problems we have is I really feel this is a nation with a huge disparity very often between who we represent ourselves as outwardly and what is going on in the inside. And that, of course, is the antagonism of being human, I think, the battle between, you know, what we're projecting and who, who is living on the inside. And I think that we have, a, a, in particular, a kind of a real disparity. And that's where people, where such unhappiness and that's where cruelty can so often come from. Yeah. And again, humour is, is probably the best way of breaking into that because you can say things in it, make a joke about things, which you very often, to touch on it in a more conventional sort of conversational way, would be just too sensitive. People wouldn't dare. 
Yeah, that's exactly it. It is that bit of going, you know, when you're on stage, you can be, and I think it is true that that is probably the closest to, it's the most real version of me. And I would probably say, you know, friends of mine, people like my friend Joe stuff, is that point where you're standing on stage and you're allowing out lots of those thoughts that were throughout the rest of your life, you're just keeping in. It must be pretty stressful, isn't it? I mean, performing the day in, day out. I find that the rest of existence is very, very stressful. I find I'm, I'm a very kind of hyper vigilant individual. You know, when I'm on stage, I know what direction people are looking in, and you have some control. When I'm on a train, when I'm on the bus, when I'm walking around towns, I'm always imagining other people's thoughts. And the good thing is that when I'm on stage, that's such a busy time that a lot of the more negative voices they really have to put their hand up and start screaming. Whereas when you're just wandering around a town or whatever, they can, you know, on full display then. Okay, so the, the real you, <laughs> the better you is on stage. But of course, I mean, you hear, you know, remember people like Tony Hancock in that. I mean, it, sometimes comedy can be just too tough. Yes. Well, I think there's an interesting, in terms of the mental health thing, when you look back to a lot of those people and, you know, Hancock and Milligan and, and Sellers, and also a lot of those people like Frankie Howard, who, you know, amongst that group, you have a, a, a lot with kind of substance abuse issues, you know, generally alcohol at, at that time. And you also have people who their sexuality was illegal. So they already have a secret that they have to, to keep, you know, because of the law. And I think that's an interesting not necessarily a change, there are still people who do it, but there are a lot of comedians now who, when they go on stage, rather than put on the mask that is hiding their secret, this is when they tell you their secret. This is when they, and, and that's an interesting change. But you're right. I mean, the, the toughness of, I was doing an event about Morecambe and Wise the other day, and we were talking about Eddie Braben, of course, you know, great writer. And the uh, it was a very interesting event. We saw, thought a woman in the front row had died at one point, but it turned out she'd just fallen asleep. So we'd, we'd merely <laughs> nearly bored her to death. This was in Harpenden. <laughs> and she did it twice, apparently. And at a later event, she also fell asleep in a way. She was quite an elderly woman that made people go, I think she died. Um <laughs> narcolepsy <laughs> but it's uh yeah i think that stress of you know each you know for hancock he would he so often he got rid of the people who were such great people to have around him like you know galton and simpson who were geniuses absolute geniuses as well you know steptoe and son is a is a work of art but it's i think that probably is of all of the arts that because comedy is judged so immediately, you can leave a drama afterwards and go, yeah, I'm not really, do you think the pinter was saying, but mm. watch a comedy and there's no laughs. You already know people have not really, they haven't not just got your message. They have not enjoyed it at all. If you have not heard the noise. Yes. So let's just reflect a little bit on some of the changes we've seen in certainly in my lifetime. I mean, you're younger than me, but we've seen a more rational approach to things like, suicide like abortion like contraception like sexuality all those those kind of rights have become embodied in in law but drugs haven't and i'm interested in your perspective why why are we so obsessed with not allowing people to have access either to, to drugs which might help them or even you know in terms of dying or might might just give them have them fun what we what's your perspective on my drug policy is just so out of kilter with with the realities of what drugs do i think again it might be what we were talking about before which is there's that the joy of having a a firm morality an unthinking morality you know i've read your book about cannabis obviously recently and you know and, and looking at the breakdown the evidence-based breakdown and it makes our, our drug policies make no sense whatsoever but the moment you say drugs People can show you their morality and they love to show you their morality. You know, you know it's, it's like, you know, that, that, that person who you see drunk in the pub and saying, I tell you what disgusts me is people who, who take and they'll say whatever drug it is, however benign that drug is. They were, or, you know, with, with Elvis Presley, I always think of the fact, you know, Nixon made him, gave him an honorary drug enforcement agent badge, didn't he? And stuff like that. And of course, Elvis Presley, he, he was taking legal drugs. I mean, the guy was filled with drugs. Yes. It's just that they were, they were the drugs where, you know, with the seal on them that said approved. And so I think a lot of it comes from a strange, unthinking morality, which allows you to elevate yourself. And I think it's a, it's a horrible habit that we have. And it's now gone on for so long that 
I don't know how we shift it. I mean, I'm, but it does see, I, I think it's an addiction to morality more than anything else. Now, that's an interesting angle. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely a lot of habitual. Well, if you look at what the. <laughs> Listen to what the Home Office says every time anyone asks them why their policies are failing. They say they're not, you know, they just have a have a macro which they print each time. You know, the same thing they've been saying for thirty years. You know, drugs are bad and drugs harm families, and our policies are working. Even that, you know, there's it's an absolute resistance to reevaluating. Or, but I think it's also about having perhaps to accept you were wrong, and that is, you know, we all know, that, you know, you know, I know that getting the truth out can be really very enlivening and, and empowering. Just unfortunately, governments don't seem to see that because it would take so much stress out of everyone if they could accept they got it wrong. And we, no one would criticise them. We'd all celebrate, I think. But also, it is a very simple way of a government showing, I mean, as we know, with the culture wars that are being you know, manipulated at the moment, something like having a hard stand on drugs, it ennobles that government amongst many people in the same way with their kind of attitude i mean watching what's going on in florida at the moment and the legislation that might go through in terms of preventing education about lgbt stuff you know for in schools again that that's a very simple way of attracting a certain kind of voter you think the pendulum's swinging back yeah yeah it's actually come to think of it you may you may be right because it's uh well you've seen the you know the texas decisions now to to stop abortion I mean, and to criminalise doctors who do it. I mean, maybe, maybe we are facing a backlash. Maybe we shouldn't be complacent. So maybe, maybe we should be, you know, shoring up those defences as well as thinking about being more sensible about drugs. And yeah, maybe that's rather worrying. And I think also because, you know, the news now is is such a dominant part of of the entertainment cycle. Because once people found out, twenty four hour news is predominantly quite cheap to make. You know, you've got to desk and you've got some lighting and you've got and so there's an enormous number of news channels and those news channels the thing that keeps people coming back to them is outrage and fury and a melodrama so you know whenever i and i very rarely do it but when i sometimes watch some of the kind of morning shows some of those kind of things like the jeremy vine show on channel five and I think here is the chance where you can have real experts on, real people with incredible experience, people who really, and instead you have two different columnists on or someone else who, again, has basically made a business out of having opinions. And it always takes me back to that wonderful book. Did you ever read Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman? I did not, but I will write it down. <laughs> it's, it's a fantastic book. And Neil Postman, he wrote it, it must have been around 1984. His general idea initially was, are we walking towards a kind of Orwellian 1984 or a Huxley and Brave New World? And and he looked at, and this is, you know, this is 30, 38 years ago that book came out. And it now is, it's still very much on the money, except I don't think he would have ever imagined just how enormous, basically, how much opinion drove the entertainment cycle. You know, and, and those times when you do every now and again see a scientist or anyone, anyone with a genuine level of expertise and research, when you actually see them on a panel of something like Question Time, it will change the dynamic immediately because everyone has to be more careful because they've actually got a woman or a man who knows now. They might not know about everything, but some of these things, they're going to, when it's just everyone has a different opinion, then they can all just spout them off. But once you, and, and I always think that changes. Again, we go back to that fight thing. You know, all of these things are, I forget now, there was another book that came out. Chris Hedges wrote a book a few years ago, which is a similar kind of almost like a, a modern take on, on Neil Postman's book. And he started off by writing about wrestling. And he said, this is what American culture is now. All of uh -huh. it. And he wrote, you know, WCW, and he wrote a lot about Donald Trump turning up and getting into the ring and doing all that stuff. And this was a few years before Trump, you know, that then actually stood as president. And you think, yeah, this is, it's all about spectacle. It's not about knowledge. It's not about learning. And as you said as well, once someone's got an opinion, as, as you know, it's that old, I think it's Mark Twain, but you can always say it's either Mark Twain or G.K. Chesterton. It's always one or other, isn't it? You know, that one about <laughs> much easier to fool someone than it is to show them that they've been fooled you know once you believe so and, and again that's the thing that i think i've been very lucky with working with lots of very interesting people who are far 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 more knowledgeable than i am 
is it's made me just accept, hold on to your truths with a very, very light grip. And I know we don't like it. I mean, I've, I've had those, you know, there are certain things that I, I want to believe and I can feel that extra bit of nausea, that kind of that stitch that you can have in the, in, you know, in, in your side as you begin to see something you believe crumbling. But if you can get over that initial nausea, then you're now you have far greater armament than you had before in terms of how to get through life. And I think, yeah, the drug thing, I can only see it as, you know, it really, it more often than not, I think is always, it's, I mean, you know, from your own experience, of course, with equity and, and those things, you know, it's an unthinking thing, which just says, so it doesn't matter how many times you say, but what I wrote was true. Ah, yes, but people don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear that, but it's true. But, oh, no, 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 no. That doesn't sell well in these areas. We'll lose votes. Well, as we before I get asked that question, I mean, how easy or hard was it to get your monkey cage program, get the BBC to buy into it? Did you have to work hard or was it, were they receptive? I mean, it's, it's a very unusual program. In fact, it's probably unique, isn't it? It's funny, I only realise every now and again how unusual it is. That's the, Every now and again I go, oh yeah, because quite often we'll have a scientist, when we have a scientist on for the first time and they'll say afterwards, I didn't know a show like this existed, you know, and, and I'm really glad that they have that. But it started off as, I mean, it, it came out of a, a pilot that I was only a guest on that was a kind of, that didn't work. And then it led to me and Brian working together and Sash, who's been our producer for all 13 years as well. And initially the BBC, it, it's not the show that you hear now. The first series was a lot, it was more like a magazine show. They insisted they had a comedy sketch in the middle that was always really annoying because <laughs> they were brilliant comedy sketch people that we had, but you'd be in the middle of a really interesting conversation and then you'd have to go, but I wonder what would happen maybe if Martians came and visited Milton Keynes. Let's, oh, yes. you know, whatever it might be. And then slowly, or, or actually quite quickly, we managed to argue for it to be recorded in front of an audience. I mean, I think the advantage we have, because it started before Brian was famous, and I think one of the advantages was that they don't really get science. I mean, I still know there's a lot of people, I think, who just, they don't really understand the show. Why would anyone listen to it? What is this? And I do think we've still got a battle with the two cultures. I wish it was not there. And sometimes I think because of the echo chamber I'm in, I think it is, is fallen apart more than it has. But I still know that people, one of the reasons people don't like science as much as they like the arts in terms of those who are in charge is they can say anything they want about when they've been to see La Traviata. Oh, I thought the, this production of La Traviata was very, I actually felt some of the weakness in it was and oh, yes, I disagree with you and then they can say whatever they like about you know the Marla concert they went to but then if they say well you see the thing that I think about quantum mechanics and if someone goes well actually our current thinking is not that they go well that's very rude isn't it because my opinion about La Traviata was excellent so I, I don't think they like the fact that there really are some opinions which you know when it when it comes to certain testable evidence-based thinking there are things where you go, that is definitely a more wrong opinion than this. And then we have the other battle, I think, which is, you know, in terms of understanding science, which is, and it's something that Brian and I have banged on about many times, but when people start to accept, as we often don't see in the news media, that science is not saying this is right. What it's saying is the best science is saying this is the least wrong answer we have now. With everything that we know and the technology we have, this is less wrong. And instead, what you'll get, as we saw during, you know, the beginning of, well, for quite, as we still see, you know, during COVID, people going, oh, it's interesting, isn't it? Scientists said this in March, but then they said that in May. And you go, yeah, there's more evidence and the evidence has changed. It's a changeable thing. If you want dogma, you're not going to like it. So I think, again, going back to drugs policy and things like that, there are a large number of people who are like dogma. They like certainty and it's always that big difference in, I love films that don't make sense. I'd much rather see a film. I, I love <laughs> David Lynch. I like those things where you can leave. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the reasons that I'm a huge fan of Beckett is, you know, something like Waiting for Godot. Beckett was not saying, I've written this play and it means this. He came up with this scenario and he comes up with these, these two characters and then the other two. That, and, and he comes up with that and he knows his belief is that it's a Rorschach test. And that not everyone will come out believing it's about the same thing. And you can argue about your meaning of it. And in fact, it, all of your arguments, your meaning is your meaning. You are allowed to take away that meaning there. You are allowed to have doubts and uncertainty about what it means. There is not one through line. And I think once you loosen up on that, 
again, you can start to address some of these big questions. And, you know, from your point of view, so, you know, these are very pragmatic issues to deal with. This is, you know, there's a real importance in understanding. I mean, I was amazed reading your book just to, well, actually not amazed, but still, you know, looking at alcohol and just seeing its damage and seeing the fact that I think you said didn't you, that it's, you know, it's kind of on the bridge, really, between class A and class B, isn't it? Oh, in terms of the harm to the user, that's right, yes. Yeah. If it was discovered today, it would clearly be, under the current decision-making or the regulations, it would clearly be illegal. I mean, it could not be. So, that, you know, history tells us that precedence is a very important thing in decision-making. <laughs> and what is also slightly strange is that, you know, we've had, a, we've had 50 years of big increase in people using cannabis. And we're pretty sure most politicians of you, well, we know some, many of them have admitted to it, but they still won't vote in favour of a, a more rational policy, which I, you know, I find disappointing, really, because you know, it hasn't harmed them. So it's clearly that, you know, they're, 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 using, they're using their hostility for political gain, you know, because, as you say, they're appealing to a, a group of people that like, like to punish others or ban others or be nasty to others. It's, you know, I find it's disappointingly, you know, when it, it's intellectually dishonest, they're not, you know, remember when Cameron came became leader of the Tory party, they said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to reclassify MDMA from A to B. And I thought, well, that's great. You know, so that's, at last, we've got a politician that, that both understands comparative ones and wants to do something about it. And the next day, you know, he was surrounded by some Tory grandees who said, so I got that wrong, sorry. Um, you know, no, no, we're definitely not going to change dog policy because that would be a... And you think, you know, that's at that level of, well, you know, the, that's it was a very, a 24-hour U-turn and what it was never been, never been rectified. Because MDMA, you know, more and more papers seem to be coming out, more and more research in terms of seeing its very positive use in, in, in therapy with things like PTSD as well and various other kind of, you know, sometimes extremely damaging and, and self-harming mental conditions. Do you think that that, the tipping point of that evidence, that because it's actually, you know, practically being used and it's making people's lives better, do you think that eventually there will just be a can? Do you have any optimism there, for instance? Well, I have optimism because eventually the absurdity of denying it to patients must come across. Because it, it's not as if the ban has stopped recreational use. That, the whole purpose of, the, of banning drugs is to stop their use and to stop harm. Is what really they're supposed to stop harm, isn't they? But government policy conflates that with use. But to, to deny it as a medicine seems to me completely perverse because the, the only people who are really suffering are patients. And that is, that is I've argued that this, the international conventions, the banning of drugs like psychedelics, like cannabis for a while, and, uh, and like MDMA, that it's the worst censorship of science, of research in the history of the world. Never have, have opportunities, scientific inquiries been so impeded. You know, we've got over 50 years in which no one has been allowed to study the value of psychedelics, even though they were widely studied in the 50s and 60s. They were shown to be useful in conditions like anxiety, depression, end of life, coming to terms with dying. We're not allowed to use them in people who might benefit simply because we didn't like the fact that some young people were using them and drawing different kinds of pictures and writing different kinds of music. I and mean, it was beyond absurd, really. We do seem to be a very conservative, you know, small C and big C quite often, but also small C conservative. I see that just across the board, that the, the desire to experiment, and I don't mean, I mean, broadly experiment with ideas seems, you know, you do have such interesting thinkers that, but it's, it's, you know, we see it in our art. We see, you know, the, I mean, I was fascinated by its leap, isn't it? The group of. Oh, law enforcement against prohibition. Yes. Yeah. And I did a couple of events with them and that was fascinating to talk to some of these people who've been very, very high up in the police force. And again, that's what that's what you need, don't you? You need these people who are what, what, what their actual own political, I mean, but who would be viewed by society as conservative figures. Yes, quite. but who are suggesting things which you know most newspapers would consider to be way beyond revolutionary and you know would be out outrageous. Those are the figures, don't you, that, that you actually need? We do, yeah. And there are quite a few, certainly in, in terms of in terms of cannabis policy, there are quite a few police chiefs who are, are positive. But you know, the government is yet to be persuaded. And also, what's unfortunate and I find quite disappointing is that Labour have really failed to seize the opportunity because it's. I'm sure most Labour voters would want at least a more rational drugs policy, but I think maybe the the Achilles heel of current Labour is that they've got a you know a previous head of public prosecutions and lawyers. It's hard for lawyers to change their spots, I suppose, 
lawyers tend to see the law as the solution to problems rather than um, maybe the reason for problems. But I, I want to talk politics. I want to talk, go back to talking about communication. And what's interesting is that, you know, your program and, you know, is, well, I mean, you do it live, but it's, we listen to it. Two thoughts, really. One, one is I've often been, and this follows on from something you said a, a little while ago, that I think the visual, the domination now that the visual media has over everything else, I find quite disturbing because, you know, it, it's, it's what gives people this interest in wrestling and or people shouting at each other and fighting. It doesn't, on the radio, that's kind of trivial, so you wouldn't bother. But I think I'm beginning to wonder whether we've become so dominated by visual input, we've actually, it's dumbed us down. So we can't, holding constructs, the kind of constructs that you're bringing up in your your program, or maybe they're being, it's harder, people aren't as skilled as, as working with the spoken word as they are with the visual image. I just wonder if you had any thoughts on that. Well, I mean, I think one of the interesting things is just how many people do listen to, you know, podcasts and audio books. And I mean, the, the figures that we have, I mean, the, the millions of people that listen every week to our show is any TV show that had our figures would be over the moon. They wouldn't believe it. You know, it's a kind of and in, 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 there's an incredible disparity. Interesting. And also what we have is we have, yeah, I mean, we, we have far more listeners than, I mean, I can't remember the 50% of our listeners are also outside the UK now, but it, it's millions every single episode, you know, 3 million plus. Don't right. worry, that's not in any way reflected in our pay. And, uh, <laughs> the, but I mean, in fact, sometimes I think the BBC forgets just that is one of the, the most unique things they have is an incredible output. I mean, there are so many broadcasters that I enormously admire and people making incredible documentaries. And I think actually the audio, there's a lot. I mean, I think of our audience and someone jokingly once said that we were kind of like Morecambe and Wise, not due to any comedic skills or anything like that, not elevators, like that, but we get eight year olds listening with their 90 year old great great grandmother or whatever it might be you know and we get family audiences and when we do live shows we have whole families turning up and i love that and i love the fact that in the you know i wonder if we were visual if we had been put on television whether then we would not you would actually narrow your audience because I, I would agree that certainly television, it seems now because everyone in the family pretty much now has their own screen, whether it's an iPad, whether it's on their phone, the television, it's a very splintered kind of, you know, entertainment yes, when yes, it's an individual, yes. but with audio, I actually think there's a very positive, you know, a lot of times when people are in cars, they're listening together, a lot of them on, the, I mean, I think that was the great thing about it going out about 4.30 was a lot of people being picked up from school, they were, you know, going off down the shop with their, their, their mum and dad or their gran or whatever it might be. So I, I think in one way, that's been the secret of its, not the secret of its success, but one of the useful things in terms of the, the broadness of the audience. And again, I, I also find, because we always wanted it to sound like a podcast, you know, it took us a couple of series to, to be allowed to cut some of the stuff out. We wanted it to have that sense that it was a conversation. We also felt it was very important that it didn't just say, today we're talking about quantum mechanics, by the end of this, you'll understand this. What we wanted yeah. to do was a, a conversation that would very often go on, you know, we, we, we talk about this jokingly, but it's entirely true. More often than not, Brian and me and Sash meet two hours before the show, we make an idea of what the questions are going to be, and we imagine a structure. That imagined structure will never become a reality because the moment it starts someone will say something in their intro and i'll go oh hang on a minute that, that's a really i did not know that about oak trees tell me explain that thing to me or brian will pick up on something and so what you, you're eavesdropping on a conversation which is not and at the end of it you don't go now i understand you don't feel that you've just done a good thing for you i read the important book i memorized it you know because i think that's another thing that's a problem with some of the kind of government attitudes that are to education which seem to be about memorizing and not about understanding and not about you know love of knowledge is the most important thing you know if that's the thing that you want to get out of, of teaching you know and, I, and certainly the number of teachers i know who, who all the time the the battle they have because they want to tell the stories and they want to, ex you know, in science in particular, there's that real problem with, you know, so many science teachers want to teach why someone came up with the equation, not just memorize the equation and what all those are. They want to tell you about when Einstein was daydreaming. They want to tell you when yeah. Marie Curie was in the lab and as she watched something, she started to think, hang on a minute, this seems to, you know, yeah. all of those things, that, that's what they want is those little stories of failure and daydreaming. And that's one of the things that we want to try and do is that people just... Yeah, the humanising. And also, yeah, it's, well, it's, it's, it's exciting, isn't it? Like, you know, because 
being in that mindset to suddenly that aha moment wow mm -hmm. that's why i love science there's nothing better than discovering something i can tell you <laughs> even if you're right <laughs> or understanding you know i'll never discover anything i don't reckon but that bit where I've I've tried to understand, like I was reading Carlo Rovelli's Helgoland, all about quantum mechanics. Oh, yeah. And Carlo I th is one of my favourite writers. I think he writes very, very beautifully, very poetically, and, and from a, a deep level of understanding, which is something I would never be able to obtain. But I just was reading in the bath, and suddenly this idea that I've read so many times, the double slit experiment, I have I have a working knowledge of what goes on, but there was a way he described that which meant that I got that feeling in the pit of my stomach and that, that incredible hit of the pictures, just this one picture, there's still, a, you know, a billion other pictures aren't quite, but that one, everything's just connected. And I now have that little bit of extra understanding. And I could look up the sky and go, everything looks different again today. And all of these solid things look different again today because I've got another, just another little bit. Well, Robin, it, it's been great talking to you. Your enthusiasm in conversation is just as great as it is when you're you're on the stage with Brian. And uh, thank you for what you do. I do hope you'll carry on doing it for a long time and, and hopefully spawn some younger people eventually to take over because it's something we should... Oh, I'm not letting any of them take over. No way. They can have their own shows. I want to... But, I mean, that's the thing Even we were talking about this, that our dream is always that we keep doing this until we die. And if one of the machines Brian was working on, then we do it after we die as well. But I'm not sure that machine is going very well. But I don't ever want to stop it because it is. And also, that's as you know, the great thing about once you start going in this area, it's never as if you're going to sit down and go, I think we've covered everything. Because at the that, no. episodes, we still, most episodes, because we only got to question two, we've even just got to go back to episode one and do the next part of all of those. Well, keep on doing it. We love it. We enjoy it. And thanks so much for sharing today this podcast. Thank you, Dave.